Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. We are once again at the legendary Sardis. Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird by Aaron Sorkin has become the most successful American play in Broadway history. It is now in its second year at the Schubert Theater where it has never played to an empty seat. They have also welcomed some new cast members, including my two guests. So please welcome Taylor Trench who plays Dill and Kyle Scatliff who plays Tom Robinson. Well, gentlemen, this is really thrilling to be sitting with you here at the legendary Sardis, Yay. right across the street from your theater at the Schubert. It's true. It's way bad, right? right? You could wave at your, you <laughs> your right there. Yeah. So my first question is, how life-changing is it being a part of this beautiful production of Mockingbird? How life-changing is it? Uh, it's it's pretty wild. For me, it's my first play that I've ever done yeah. on Broadway, which is like, it's like, wee, <laughs> Um so so and it's also um a show i did in high school um so it, it was really cool that my first play was was the show I, a show i did in high school that was one of the first shows that made me want to do this um as a profession and um it's it's pretty amazing to have a story that that many people love and that that many people want to come see on broadway and and you know i mean the show is lights out it's making so much money that you're just kind of <laughs> like wow oh it's like you, it becomes a groundswell of of, of, a, of a kind of a beautiful moment um, that Broadway happens has every once in a while, and this is such a special moment in itself, being you know the most uh, lauded play. So it's great. Yeah, it's so rare to be a part of something that's like financially and critically the most successful yeah. American play yes. in Broadway history, yeah. but then also to be a part of something that's very meaningful. That there's like uh, we're hopefully inspiring audience members to like stand up and take action and make a change. Mm -hmm. But see, that's what I love when I walk by the Schubert Theater. You have every demographic, every age range, mm -hmm. like everybody I talk to, I'm like, what are you going to see? We're going to see Mockingbird, or we're mm -hmm. trying to get tickets to see To Kill a Mockingbird. And that must be so great, like you were saying, totally. to want to see a play. Yeah, yeah, yes, it was, yeah, it's interesting, actually, in the past uh, week, I've, there are people I bumped into at the stage door that were like, we were making choices between plays and we didn't know what to watch. And, yeah. and they came and saw our show and you'd see them at the door and they're like, we're so glad we made that choice. Uh, yeah. and I was just like, oh, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know? take that. Yeah. yeah. Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> you have friends in that show yeah, too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm actually dying to see. Can someone get me tickets? <laughs> <laughs> and they're right next door. They're right next door, yes. Yeah. So what was your first introduction to Mockingbird? Was it the book or was it the film? I read the book, I think, three mm. times throughout school. I read it in fifth grade and then again in middle school and then in high school. And my mom, it was very important to her and the film was as well. So then she introduced me to the film. Um, and it was always, I'm so lucky I read it so early because as a white person, it was like the first time I became fully aware of the fact that there are two systems of justice in this yeah. country for people, depending on your race. So I'm glad that I found it as early as I did. Um, and yeah, I've seen the movie also a dozen times. I think it's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I came across the play first um, because you know high school did the play, um, and then I read the book while I was uh, in the play, and then I saw the movie. Um, and of course, the movie's a classic. It's like it's I've seen it several times uh, throughout my life, and and I've always um, found it to be a really a really interesting scope into the world of a world that you that you don't know and a world that's hard to know um because we're so far ahead in the future now but it it always became uh, such an incredible thing to actually see because when i was younger i didn't you did, i didn't see a lot of those things and you know the internet isn't as prevalent it wasn't as prevalent as it is now um when it comes to being able to see injustice, um, uh, and I wasn't much of a news watcher either, <laughs> so so like watching that movie was like one of the first times I saw a representation of that, um, and and uh, and what that means and what we can do to try to stop it. Yeah, yeah. It's more relevant now mm -hmm. than it was when it was written, which is really scary. Yes. I mean, what does yes. that mean to working God. on this? I know it's so crazy that it was yeah. written in the. Written in the 60s, about the 30s. Now we're in 2020. Yeah. And Aaron Sorkin has said he's taken lines, he's taken like comments from Breitbart and put them into the play and assigned them to characters, and they don't sound out of place. Like they make yeah, just they as much sense in the place. 1930s they as they do now. Which yeah. Is like horrifying. But, <laughs> yes. Um, it's a scary concept, but it's um, it, it. Sometimes I, I like to think that you know, 
things become more relevant because those things are dying out, hopefully. Um, um, and sometimes that's the backlash of it. It's like the last scream of a dying, mm -hmm. uh, dying moment. Um, and that's kind of how I look at it at times where you, the, I feel like the country as a whole is starting, especially with the youth that are coming up, are, are leaning further and further, further left. And it's kind of like the last dying out yell of, of, of a time period that we don't know much about and kind of don't understand, but also we're like, why, why did you do this in the first place? Yeah. Um, so, so that's the hope at least. <laughs> These are such coveted roles. Mm. How intense was the audition process for you two? Oh, so it's like, I, she don't even I, know. <laughs> I didn't have to audition. Um, I was very lucky. I yeah. got invited to read the very first draft of the script. Aaron and Bart invited me to read, and Scott yeah. um, invited me to read the very first draft. And it was me and Celia Keenan-Bolger and Will Pullen and Je uh, Jeff Daniels and Latanya, a lot of the original gang. Um, and they told the three of us, Celia, Will, and myself, they were like, it's not going to be you guys. We're going to get nine-year-olds, <laughs> like, fat chance. Um, <laughs> get out of here. We're gonna, um, but we read, the, we read yeah. the script, and we were, like, so mad. We were like, gosh darn it, which, like, ten-year-old's going to get to play this incredible part? <laughs> and then at the end of the reading, Scott changed his mind and decided it could be adults. Yeah. Um, but I'd already signed on to Dear Evan Hansen, so I did that for a year. And yeah. I was lucky that they asked me to come back and replace Gideon. Um, when he finished his brilliant Tony nominated yeah. run. Yeah. That's great. And for you, yeah. Kyle. Uh, I was on tour with Hamilton for uh, a year. It's a great show. Highly recommend it. For a year and a half. And, uh, I Another was, tough chicken. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was, and I was coming off tour, uh, I believe it was August. Um, so it was, my last, it was my last little stint on tour. We were in Memphis yeah. and I had three weeks left to tour. Um, got this email for an audition. And they were like, hey, uh, they, they'd like you to send in a tape. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, sure. Um, so I send the tape in and like, don't hear anything for a week. And I'm like, all right, well, that's yeah. done. Like, you know, it's like, I'm not getting that. Um, and a week later, uh, I'm talking to my manager and she's like, I actually still in the running for that. And I was like, really? Okay. I was like, it's been two weeks, but all right. <laughs> um, so, and so like literally like the day after she told me that uh, uh, my agents called me and they're like, so you got it. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> no, they're, like, they're like, yeah, yeah, they cast you. I was like, off the tape? What are you talking about? I was like, Gosh. there was no like callback yeah. or anything. And I was kind of like confused about it because I was like, what are you, what's going on here? And, I, and, and I'm like, well, wait, I was like, Scott doesn't even know who I am. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a, and I'd never worked with Bart. And, and it was actually kind of one of those funny things that I always tell students this. I'm like, yeah. you, be good to the people you work for because so you never know. Because literally the next day, uh, Tommy was coming to to do like you know he comes to the uh, uh, to the tours and he does Tommy Kale yeah Tommy Kale does his does his good old directing thing and he sees me he goes hey congratulations and I was like how do you know <laughs> and, he, and he's like you know he just kind of shrugged and I was like somebody called you and asked totally. like just like people were you know it's always that that you know old adage you know it's just be, be a good employer be a good person to work for and. Um, because people will eventually have to ask those people if yes. they want to cast you. So the thing that was crazy about it is that after all that happened, um, I was literally uh, going to be on stage in two weeks from the moment that they uh, had auditioned me. So that I got the part. So basically, um, Bengo was getting a knee surgery and they yeah. needed someone to go on, go on for like uh, possibly two weeks. And it ended up being 10 shows over a week and a half. And, um, and I did it. It was crazy. So like I had one week of rehearsal with Jeff and Bart and learned everything and, <laughs> and did the show. So you went into the show first? Yeah. For 10 shows and then I came back for the six months, yeah. Okay. <laughs> before we get into, I know, it's nuts. Before we get into characters and stuff, these are such beautifully written roles. Uh, what do you remember about that first night on stage for you in Mockingbird yeah. and the first night for you on stage in Mockingbird? Uh, basically stare at Jeff Daniels' eyes and say your lines. <laughs> Like, you know, yeah. it was when it was a thing we, that he was say, saying to me, too, when uh, we had a rehearsal on the Thursday before I went on on the Tuesday. And he was just like, it's you and me. Like, you know, it's us together. Don't worry about any of those people out in the audience. Don't worry about any of that. It's just you and me. Oh my God, I'm worried about you because you're Jeff Daniels. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know Don't I mean? worry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just you and me, yeah. and that's it. And I said, okay. Um, it's kind of crazy because, like, you don't really remember much. I just 
said it all and did, did what I was supposed to do. And, and I just, took a bow. And yeah, and a bow. And, and it was crazy because when, uh, he, when he came to do his bow, he kind of like looked at me and he was just like, good. And I was just like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like you feel proud. You're like, oh, I made my father proud. <laughs> it was what great. was your first one like? We had an invited dress. Oh yeah, for, um, which is so rare for a play that yeah. already is up and running, and it was like an electrifying performance. I remember mm -hmm. that it was so many like theater industry yeah. types in the audience, and it just felt really supportive. And people were screaming at the top of their lungs. Yeah. It was like the closest <laughs> we've gotten to Madison Square Garden yeah. in our run, kind of people just like so thrilled to be there. All right, well, let's get into Madison Square Garden. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That has to have been the most life-changing moment mm. in your career, probably will ever be, totally, to yeah. do a play at Madison Square Garden, right? The <laughs> first crazy. ever, 18,000 <laughs> students. Mm -hmm. All right, favorite memories of that day. There must be so many oh for the two God, of you. Let's start so with that. Many. Oh, my God. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> uh, First off, just when we were walking to the VOMs before the show started, and as you're walking to the VOMs and you can hear the murmur of just like conversation and talking and how like just what 18,000 people sound, sound like. And then we got to the VOM and you could just see all of them and the garden was full. And it was just, uh, like there's a picture um, on the Mockingbird Instagram actually of a couple yeah. of us just kind of standing there like <laughs> <laughs> it's me and David um, and Russell just like what and like it's in because I've I, I've never seen anything like it yeah. you know I, I I've had the pleasure to do a lot of cool things in my career but like that was something that I I couldn't have imagined and I've never seen anything like it in my life um, and it was like that moment and then like a lot of the ways that the students. Uh, were responding to a lot of the lines were things that I I couldn't even dream of. It was amazing. Yeah. Especially like the first time Bob Yule goes yeah. to the porch. Oh god, yeah. And yeah, and like I'm just, just the kind of backstage like uh, like, you know, they're gonna they're about to find out what this play is about. Yeah. You know, it's like you you have all of the setup and you may have like uh the sheriff referring to me, you know, using the N-word because it's like that's what Bob Yule said. Yeah. But to have the actual man himself stand on stage in front of Atticus and spew that kind of hatred. You could just feel all of them kind of like start to slowly <laughs> lean in, just like, mm -hmm. what is, like, and it was just like, because they had read the book and they know what it is yeah. and the amount of silence that was in that room because of how well they were listening, it was unbelievable, it was unbelievable. It's truly a, an incredible experience. It yeah. was extraordinary. There was a high school choir that sang from mm -hmm. Brooklyn, mm -hmm. who sang before the show also, oh, and that, every single person in the cast was like, yeah, like before it even started, I was just... literally sitting there going, "Think terrible things." Think terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "I don't want to get lost in this moment." I like, I, it was beautiful, but I was like, "We gotta think." I, I gotta think. But it was, yeah, that was. It was so beautiful. Like the yeah. soloists <sighs> were incredible. I was like, "Is someone here to give them recording contracts?" <laughs> they were so good. That was a highlight. And yeah, like Kyle said, just hearing eighteen thousand people react, they were so yeah. engaged. Mm -hmm. I had this. I guess I expected, like, thinking about myself when I was, yeah. like, 13, 14, like, I was so dumb. Yeah. Like, if someone was like, you have to see a play for three hours, I'd be like, ugh. <laughs> but they were so engaged. They were such good listeners. And they would get so vocal and excited whenever someone stood up to injustice or, like, one of the, like, vile racists in the yeah. play. Mm -hmm. But then they also, like, just as loudly reacted when someone had empathy. Like, mm -hmm. there's a moment in the second act of the play where, like, two characters embrace and... Um, Atticus gives me a kiss on the head at one point in the oh, second yeah. act and it was like just as loud for that and that was like so special to hear this new generation of people who care just as much about fighting as they do also like creating a world that makes room for everybody. I want you to think about the power of the individual to make a change in society. The only way to change the world is if you decide it is your world to change. Don't let anybody tell you you can't be an artist.
Well, let's go back <clears throat> to characters. These are such beautifully written roles. Mm. Talk about who you each play and what you've learned about yourselves from playing these roles. Uh, I play Tom Robinson. Um, he is the, the accused uh, of the show. Um, this role now especially has been really helpful for me in this, especially in this year when we're in the middle of an election. Um, and because I always have this part of me that, <clears throat> and, and this is kind of, I said this on Instagram the other day too, is like while doing the role you start to realize that you are, um, you kind of living your character's life in the 20s, in, in like, you know, 80 years ahead mm -hmm. um, in a strange way where you feel like you're caught in between two factions of people that are fighting each other but you have nothing to do with the fight that they're having you know it's like it's it's this thing where and i always look at that with like bob ewell and atticus finch and like you know atticus thinking that everything is exactly the way he thinks it is and bob saying you know this is what i believe and they're constantly fighting and they're fighting over not only you as a person but you as an ideology and it's a very odd thing because that's exactly what's happening now all the time. Um, and it kind of weirds me out when I, when I start to realize that more and more on a daily basis uh, while we're doing the show, um, that you know, growing up black in America, that is, that is kind of the struggle we're in where we don't know who we're supposed to trust or who we're supposed to um, look to for help. Um, and you're, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing you can help is yourself. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what's helped me get to even that part of the show where he tr figures out um, what, what dignity is for himself. Um, because he's just caught in this, in this whirlwind of a war between all of these people and he's just trying to be a good person. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, connect with that a lot. We're just, I, just trying to be a good person and trying to make the world a better place. and. Um, but you're also constantly being hit at all sides with, uh, with social problems all the time. Um, yeah. Beautifully put. I agree. Yeah. I don't want to go now. No, no, um, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Darn it. Yeah. Um, I play Dill yeah. Harris, Charles Baker Harris. He is the best friend of um, Jem and Scout. Um, he's I my like, favorite. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <You're mine. laughs> um, he's, he's like a tender clown. Yeah which is who I tend to play, like someone who's a little dim, <laughs> ready to laugh. Um, uh, he is wonderful. I love him so much. He's like, we've, or we've, I didn't write the play at all. Um, Aaron Sorkin, yeah. the brilliant Aaron Sorkin, also has like interpolated bits of Truman Capote's life into the character because Harper Lee and Truman Capote were childhood best friends yeah. and he's based on Truman Capote. And so we've, Aaron has like taken sort of what has become of Truman Capote in his own life and put a little bit of that into the character to, to further like enrich in his life, um, which is so much fun. Um, I think he's like cracked me open a little bit. I tend to be like this with yeah. people and he is so open-hearted and optimistic and I feel like he's helped me be more open in the, in the world. Mm. Beautifully put. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like living in the words of Aaron Sorkin? Yeah, I'm, oh my God. <laughs> That's like, it's like a fangirl over him sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if he knows that. Yeah. I never tell him that. <laughs> I just, you know, when you meet him, you're like, I'm so glad to be yeah. working, working on anything you write. Um, I mean, you could write something on a napkin right now and I will go and present yeah, it. <laughs> um, like his, his writing style has always been one of my favorites, you know, from West Wing, Social Network, anything he's ever created. It's, um, it's always been a, a, a dream of mine to work with him. Uh, it's just hilarious because I never like really do this. Like I'm like, ah, I can't, I can't go over him. I literally do. He, does, he has no idea. I've never told him, don't watch this interview. Right? <laughs> He's watching, right oh, he's, now. Gonna see. he's watching it right now. He's watching it right now. He's like, oh. Never but, um, working with that guy again. <laughs> but like, there's always been um, it, everything that we were taught in school at, at AMDO, you know, about being dead letter perfect and like yeah. and timing and things of that. And I know how important those things are to him. And, um, and I know how important those things are were to uh, Jeff as well when I had first came in. So that was like, even like as soon as I found out I had it, it was just like, okay, I'm going to have this memorized by Tuesday. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you just, it's the kind of um, writing that you get up in the morning wanting to, wanting to uh, 
portray. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. it's incredible. I I um it's just the way that he can mix um comedy with 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 terror, with horror and like how even in the middle of a scene where something truly horrible is happening, he he finds the light in those mm-hmm. moments that that can give the audience that breather just for a second enough so he can to throw the rest of it down their throat immediately. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's truly, yeah, I'm very happy. You're so right. There's also just like no better American writer, I yeah. think, to write a play that takes place in and around a courtroom. Mm-hmm. Like there's just no better right. mind to do that. And it's, I'm, we're so very lucky to be doing this play. Yeah. You're working with one of the most brilliant directors. I mean, Bart Scher, hands down. Mm-hmm. One of the most sought after directors. What makes him so wonderful to work with? Mm. You His gorgeous it? locks. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, those two. Yeah, of course. He just, they're always flowing. Yeah. Flowing. Um, yeah. Salt and pepper. Yeah. He is, um, I feel like I, I, I always hear this term like an actor's director, and yeah. I don't really know what that means. And then working with Bart, I was like, oh, he's that. He cares so much. He likes working with actors. I think that's not always the case. Like, yeah. Bart really loves actors and loves working with actors, and he's so attentive and detailed um, and smart. Uh, it's like, yeah, he's, I don't know, he's the best. He's so good. Yeah, one of the uh, cooler things about him that I've, you always notice when he's in the middle of directing is like, he's, he's directing it, directing it, and then even if he like turns his back on it, he's still listening mm-hmm. to it. He's still listening to it, and he's like almost looking at other people in the room that are listening to it too, just to see their reactions and gauge. And he's always, he's so good at um, gauging a room and <clears throat> understanding um, what, what needs to be done in order to not only make the audience happy and get it, but also to get each individual actor to that place. Um, I think that's what I like about him the most is that he doesn't he doesn't expect you to be like any of the actors that have come before or the oh. ones that'll come afterwards. He just kind of he, he finds what that part is inside of you as yeah. a person. Um, so like because of that, like he could direct 10 different versions of this, and I think all of them would look mm-hmm. slightly different in their way, in that way. And he will. Because he will. <laughs> yes, he will. <laughs> he will. But yeah, you're so right. He is so open yeah. to, it's almost an entirely new cast, and yeah. you've mm-hmm. lived inside of the previous version, and I got to see it as an audience member, and it feels so totally different mm-hmm. from that version, and it's still as effective and works, which is like such a testament to him, I think, and his eye. Because now you have the brilliant Ed Harris mm-hmm. playing Atticus, so like, because you played it with Jeff. Yeah. And now you're playing it with Ed, mm-hmm. and now you're playing it with Ed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love Ed Harris. Mm-hmm. So what's it like sharing the stage with him and your other new fellow cast members? He's totally different from Jeff Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, it, that's what's so cool about it. It's like how you can find a, a character uh, in someone and how totally different it could be in the, the perspective he comes at it, at it with. Uh, he has this, this stage presence that uh, I... On a daily basis, I'm staring at him, basically trying to figure out how the hell to do what he's doing. <laughs> um, because he has this this presence of um, not only being extremely attentive to what's happening in front of him, but there's this, and I don't know if it's confidence or if it's, um, maybe it is confidence. There's this confidence of like knowing all eyes are on him and he's just kind of like, it's just what it is, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's 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 that true moment of like looking at an actor and being like, you are so present right now, and yeah. you are also at the same time commanding so much of this space, um, but you're not even bar- you're barely doing anything. Mm-hmm. There's something really incredible about that. That's some it's really special when you when you come across someone like that. Um, yeah, he's, he's he's an intense dude. I love him. He's really fun to work with, yeah. He's, ama- he's amazing. It's like, <clears throat> it feels silly to say that he's talented, but he's exactly. so preposterously <laughs> good in the play. He's so grounded, and mm. like everything is so crystal clear. And yeah, it's, you're so right. Like All these eyes are on him. He's above the title. People are coming to see Ed Harris. There's so much pressure on him. But he's always like so relaxed, mm-hmm. so present. He takes it so seriously. Like mm-hmm. He always wants to do a good job, but it also can be so playful on stage. He's like, I, there just has never been a better scene partner in my acting career. Mm-hmm. He's so good. 
Well, you know, so much of this has to do with the brilliance of Scott Rudin. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one, no one produces a show the way Scott does, nope. down to the finest detail of everything about a show. I mean, I knew when you were all going in, this new company, mm -hmm. I mean, you got four weeks of rehearsal? That's right. Yeah, yeah, four yeah, weeks, yeah. I mean, that's unheard of. I know Sonia Freeman does it, but mm -hmm. there are very few people you should get like, you know, a week, mm -hmm. a put in and you're on. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about, you know, the brilliance of Scott. Mm -hmm. Was it, did it make it a little easier having four weeks to sort of work yourself into this production? Yes, definitely. I mean, especially with a, uh, it was like a, most of the, well, all the principals yeah. were, were, were new. So, um, and there were a couple of things that we needed to figure out as well. Because um, Russell Harford, who yeah. plays Link D's, of course, is, um, he's a deaf actor. So, you know, we had to figure out how do we incorporate sign language into the show. And, um, and how do we um, basically pull everyone into this world together so, so we all um, not only know what we're about to do on stage, but we're all on the same page. Um, and, you know, it's a testament to the ensemble as well because they oh, yeah. did the show at night at the same time as they were coming to rehearsal during the day. And also um, uh, to Neil, who plays Bob Ewell, who, oh, yes. who was playing Link D's at night and then doing, uh, you know, Bob Ewell during the day. Uh, during that whole process, so it was it was a whirlwind of a process, but it was the four weeks were, were definitely needed, and um, it was a it was a pleasure to have them. I mean, and thank you, Scott, for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It let us take ownership over the yes. show in a, mm -hmm. in a wonderful way. That, like you said, I don't think I've replaced before, and you've replaced before. Yeah. I yeah. guess when you're sort of just thrown into the mix into something that's already up and running, you are just trying desperately not to like mess anybody up. Yeah. And so to have four weeks <laughs> to like what felt like create a new play was so. We were so lucky to have that. Now, who gets to the theater first? Who likes to get there early? You probably get there earlier than okay. I do. You're coming from New Jersey. Yeah, I think oh, okay. I get there like a half, like 15 minutes, half Before hour. a half hour? Yeah, yeah. I usually come to the city, I eat, and then I go to the theater. Okay. <laughs> so I end up there a little So early. you have dinner before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. early do you get to the theater? I'm like running through the door as they're calling me. <laughs> Are you serious? I know. It's I Taylor Trudeau. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I'm a disgrace. Oh, no. no. No, there are a lot of stars. Docker Channing is one of those. She told me, she said, Richard, I like to go in right before, put the wig on, and just go on. Me too. Yeah, the waiting around sometimes does get yeah. to you. Yeah. It's like, you know, you, you kind of, if you get there early, too early, because I'll get there and I'll just yeah. be sitting in my dressing room staring at the news. Okay. Just yeah, like, right. all right, <laughs> come on. Like, you know, <laughs> just like waiting for the show to happen. Um, but some people like that prep time, like yeah. to be in their area, but you like to just get there. Like, I think I've been lucky enough to be yeah. working in theater here in New York for yeah. 10 years. And I love this city, but Times Square is yeah. the craziest yeah. place on earth. And so the like least amount of time I yeah. can spend walking through people in Times Square is good for me. Honestly, I agree. <laughs> is it happy for you to be back at the Schubert where you were with Hello Dolly when Incredible. you walked through that stage door again? Yeah, it's, and I did Matilda at the Schubert as well, yeah. so it's my third time. Third, okay. They can't kick me out. I, <laughs> I'm like gonna haunt that theater. Do you have the same dressing room? No, I've really, I've kind of bounced around. I started in the basement okay. where a rat ran across my foot once. Okay. During um, Matilda. During Matilda, okay. correct. It was the men's ensemble room. room. Old dressing room for Hello Dolly, right? Yes, yes and I, I was mean... on the tippy, tippity top floor yes. where Kyle is now. Oh, so you're in his so, dressing room yeah, for Dolly? Dressing room. So my asthma was bad, but my bones <laughs> were tight. And then now I'm sort of in the middle of my own dressing room, not sure to anybody. It feels very... I feel like Dr. <laughs> Candy. So you have to have him, you have to bring him up to his old dressing room, and he has to do some Hello Dolly for you because oh, please. Done. Please do. His part of you was great. Okay. Uh, um, if you could sum up the best part of the experience <gasps> oh, of being boy. a part of the show that's right across the street, Mockingbird, oh, as you're looking Scout. through the window. No. Oh, Taylor Trent. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. You know, for me, the best part of almost every theater experience, and I, it's such an odd thing to say, but I, the, I think I love the community aspect of putting yeah. a show together with everybody. And when we, when a cast uh, does a really good job of making sure that aspect is a beautiful thing uh, off stage, the work on stage tends to, you know, grow for that. Because the more comfortable you feel with those people, the the better it becomes. Um, and I and I've really. I had the pleasure of being in a lot of casts that had that aspect to them. And, and as far as I've seen, every time that's happened, the show has done really well. <laughs> so so um, I feel like from the top down, um, you have this aspect of knowing that we're all in this together. And uh, we could do wonders to, to create something that can help change people's mindsets or change the world in, su in such a way. Sure. Yeah. 
For you, sir. Um, can I do a tie answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's tied between the ca the people we get to work with yeah. the cast. I'm, I'm like, get to be on stage with so many people I've been a fan of for a long time, including mm. Kyle. Kyle, Lisa Gay Hamilton, yeah. Ed Harris, Russell Harvard, like Dakin <laughs> Matthews, Chris Invar. There are so many people that I've yeah. loved that I've seen in shows. And like when I saw Kyle in the color purple, I left like screaming. I was just like, <laughs> ah, who is that? Um, uh, so I, that is like, I'm just so lucky to be working with so many actors I admire. And then also to be doing a play where hopefully we're inspiring audience members to go out into the world and every day take steps to dismantle a system of oppression. The, yeah. cool, the yeah. cool thing about that is I saw him in Curious Incident and had the same moment. <laughs> I think it was the first time he went on, too. Oh, God. I believe it was the first time he went on. Scary. Um, and I went there, me and my friend Bree went and watched it, and I was like, that kid was amazing. Was I was like, who was that? And then when I saw your name, yeah. I was like, I know that name. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I was like, oh, yes, awesome. Oh, I can't wait to work with him. <laughs> yeah. And now look where you are. Yeah, yeah. no, it's so cool. It's Sardi. <laughs> I have had the best time sitting with the two of you. you too. You're at the top of your game, doing the best of what you do, and thank you for sitting with us today. Thank oh, you. No problem. Thanks for having me.